Good evening. My name is Daniel Dart and I coordinate public programs for the Minnesota Historical Society. Welcome to tonight's History Forum lecture with Professor Martha Jones. This season, we are exploring four histories that belie and challenge the national motto, E Pluribus Unum, and offer a richer understanding of the divergent currents that have always been at work within this place known as the United States. In her 2020 victory speech, then president, vice president-elect, you know, that was an interesting slip, vice president-elect Kamala Harris, paid tribute to black women as the backbone of our democracy. Black women have been leading change in this country since its inception, and their work has been integral to the expansion of American democracy, especially with regard to voting rights. In the standard story, the crusade of women's suffrage began in Seneca Falls in 1848 and ended with the ratification of the 19th Amendment in 1920. But this overwhelmingly white women's movement did not win the, white, win the vote for most black women. Securing their rights required a movement of their own. From Mariah Stewart through Mary Church Terrell to Fannie Lou Hamer, they fied both racism and sexism to fight for the ballot. They have stood at the vanguard of women's rights. They have wielded their political power to secure the equality and dignity of all persons. And they have called on America to realize its best ideals. Dr. Martha Jones, the author of the much lauded book, Vanguard, How Black Women Broke Barriers, Won the Vote and Fought for Rights for All, is here with us this evening to guide our exploration of these women's stories. She is the Society of Black Alumni Presidential Professor and Professor of History at the SNF Agora Institute at Johns Hopkins University. Jones has been a contributor to the New York Times, Washington Post, The Atlantic, USA Today, Public Books, Talking Points Memo, Politico, The Chronicle of Higher Education and Time, which recently selected Vanguard for its list of 100 must reads. She holds a PhD in history from Columbia University and a JD from the CUNY School of Law, and she is a distinguished lecturer for the Organization of American Historians. Please welcome her. Good evening. Um, thank you very much, Danielle, um, for that introduction. And thanks to everybody there for um, having me back with you um, for, uh, going the extra mile to create this opportunity for us to be together virtually. Uh, it wasn't uh, so long ago that I was with you there in St. Paul and uh, it was this time of year, if I'm not mistaken. So um, I have a sense of the atmospherics, um, but also the richness um, of your institution. So um, I thank you very much for the chance to come back. Um, and talk to you about uh, this evening about Vanguard and um, some of my exploration of how African-American women have fit um, and continue to make their mark in the history of um, American democracy, uh, the history of voting rights and a great deal more. Um, I've been invited to talk with you for about 45 or 50 minutes. Um, and then I know we'll have time for questions and comments. So um, please stay tuned for that. I very much look forward to hearing from you all um, and having this be a real dialogue between us. I am somebody uh, who last year in 2020, um, when you mentioned to me that you were celebrating the centennial of the 19th Amendment, um, the Women's Suffrage Amendment to the Constitution, um, you might have noticed me hesitate. Um, now, don't get me wrong, I had just finished a book about the history of Black women and voting rights, and so I was as interested as anyone might be in this anniversary and its significance to the nation's past. Um, and at the same time, it was true that I couldn't quite muster a spirit of celebration for the occasion. Um, the story I had to tell uh, really tempered that. Uh, when we appreciate what an open secret Black women's disenfranchisement was in 1920, the facts of the 19th Amendment fit, I think only awkwardly, with events that featured light shows or period costumes or marching bands. Um, in 1920, members of Congress who promulgated the 19th Amendment, state lawmakers who ratified it, and suffragists themselves 
all understood that nothing in its terms would prohibit states from strategically using poll taxes, literacy tests, and understanding clauses to keep Black women from registering to vote. Nothing in the new amendment promised to curb the intimidation and violence that would indeed threaten Black women who came out to polling places that season. In 1920, voting rights and voter suppression went hand in hand. Now, fortunately, um, I'm a historian, which means there's nothing in my job that requires me to plan commemoration festivities. Um, my work is to, um, in part, wrestle with uh, the distance, um, the disjuncture uh, between half-truths and myths about the past um, and the critical insights that historical thinking um, might offer to us. Um, and when I'm asked why I stayed home from those celebrations, I note that the centennial of the 19th Amendment marked a milestone in the American story of voting rights. I add that remembering the, that era of voter suppression can help us to see more clearly how ballots are being withheld from Americans in our own time. And it might even encourage us to recommit to the ongoing work of ensuring voting rights for all Americans. Um, and still, um, I wasn't quite ready to celebrate the promise of voting rights for all still, I think, remains on the horizon in this country. So I want to return to this theme of the distance between history and myths and use my time with you to bring us back to August of 1920, um, the month during which the 19th Amendment became part of the Constitution, and to look critically at two myths that I think um, to often surround thinking of the about the 19th Amendment and women's voting rights. The first myth is that when the amendment became law, that all American women won the vote. Now, you might even hear it said that women were guaranteed the vote by way of the 19th Amendment. There is another myth, um, the second, that goes almost contrary to the first, which it says black women gained the vote, um, no black women gained the vote in 1920, that racism kept black women from the polls. Um, so my goal tonight is re to replace some of that mythology with history um, and to underscore um, the much more complex story of voting rights at a critical moment in our national history. So what happened in August of 1920? The US Secretary of State certified that the 19th Amendment to the Constitution had been ratified by the required 36 states. Um, and I'll remind you um, of the text of the amendment in part because it's brief. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. So what precisely did that mean for American women? Well, now laws that had reserved the ballot for men violated the Constitution. They were unenforceable. But still, the 19th Amendment did not promise women the vote. Laws, state laws, still kept women from the polls based upon age, citizenship, residency, mental competence. In 1920, it was still true that American women who married non-U.S citizens were denaturalized, lost their citizenship and their eligibility to vote. So in the fall of 1920, the women who showed up to register confronted a lot of hurdles, even if sex wasn't one of them. There was, of course, one additional barrier to women's votes that persisted even after a federal amendment, and that was racism. It was true that the 15th Amendment in 1870 had expressly forbid states from denying the vote because of race. But by 1920, lawmakers in the South and the West had set in place hurdles that, while they were silent on their face about race, had the net effect of disenfranchising Black Americans. Poll taxes, literacy tests, grandfather clauses effectively kept many Black men from casting their ballots. This had been true since the 1890s. Unchecked intimidation and the threat of lynching sealed the deal. Local voting officials effectively constructed a color line 
without ever invoking race. So did American women win the vote in 1920? Not all women. African-American women in too many states became near equals to their fathers and husbands. State laws disenfranchised them in an end run around the objectives of the 15th and 19th Amendments. And registration numbers reflected the effects of discriminatory laws. In the fall of 1920, Black women presented themselves to voting officials, but too many found that the books were indeed closed. And still, the first waves of Black women voters had been unleashed years before, as individual states had made women's suffrage the law. In California, starting in 1911, Illinois in 1913, New York in 1917, Black women were already experienced voters by 1920. And it was only with a federal amendment that many more managed to register and cast ballots that fall in the wake of the 19th Amendment. How did they do that? One example comes from the city of St. Louis in Missouri, where Black women organized under the auspices of the city's Black YWCA, the Phyllis Wheatley branched, named for the 18th century enslaved poet. There in St. Louis, Black women ran suffrage schools and prepared for their chance to register, teaching one another how to pay poll taxes, how to pass literacy tests, even when they were administered by begrudging officials. Black women turned out that fall of 1920 in St. Louis, and papers reported that nearly every woman in the city registered that season, Black and white. But black and white women did not come to this moment in St. Louis for quite the same objectives. It was true that black women in part organized and registered to vote um, as a way of realizing the promise of the 19th Amendment um, to fulfilling its promise um, that American women would become members fully of the body politic. Um, at the same time, Black women in St. Louis are registering because the city there is setting in place a new and burdensome housing segregation scheme, and it is using voter referenda to do so. So Black women in St. Louis register and turn out to vote yes, to fulfill the 19th Amendment, but also to combat racial discrimination, to add their votes to the votes of African-American men in a city like St. Louis, and to defeat discrimination. Another example comes from the city of Daytona in Florida, where educator and leader of the National Association of Colored Women, Mary McLeod Bethune, is traveling the state in 1920, encouraging black women to register. Mrs. Bethune in Florida is however, being met by brutal opposition each step along the way, organized Ku Klux Klan violence intended to keep black Americans, men and women from the polls in that year. Black women did manage to join the voter rolls in Florida but the intimidation and violence continued. Mrs. Bethune had one special notice, regrettably, and on election day eve in 1920, white-robed Ku Klux Klansmen marched onto the grounds of her girls' school in the city of Daytona, aiming to scare black women away from the polls. Mrs. Bethune, her faculty, and the women of Daytona generally. The next day, the women stood strong and they turned out in numbers and in mass uh, in Daytona, taking safety in their numbers and determinately casting their ballots. But the violence continued in Daytona and throughout Florida. And by 1922, Mrs. Bethune and other voting rights advocates in the black community would in essence be compelled to abandon the most public dimensions of their campaigns. The conditions were too 
uh, dangerous and um, more to the point, I think, there was nothing in the 19th Amendment that could be used to quell the kind of violence and intimidation that was being directed at women like Mrs. Bethune. So in the fall of 1920, um, after election season wrapped up and black women looked out across the national landscape, what they discovered um, was a uneven patchwork with too many of them, especially in the American South, being kept from the polls. And it was time clearly for a recommitment, a new commitment to women's voting rights, the building of a campaign um, that would ensure all black women would get to the polls. Enter Hallie Quinn Brown of Ohio. Hallie Quinn Brown was an educator, a club movement leader who by 1920 is president of the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs, the largest political organization of black women in the United States, some 300,000 plus women strong. Hallie Quinn Brown is charged with leading this organization and black women generally into the next season of their struggle for voting rights. And she sets her sights on winning now federal legislation, a federal law that would enforce the spirit of the 19th Amendment and defeat those state laws that are keeping black women from the polls, defeat the violence and intimidation that are preventing them from casting their ballots. How to accomplish this? Brown is regrouping. And while she has the support of her organization, she recognizes that it will take more than the National Association of Colored Women in order to win this federal legislation. She appreciates um, the skill, the savvy, the tenacity, um, the creativity, um, and the daring of uh, the women who had led the campaign um, to the 19th Amendment. And she appeals directly to Alice Paul, who is at the helm of the National Women's Party and has won uh, a deserved reputation as among the most radical of women's suffrage activists. She calls on Alice Paul in the winter of 1921, and her purpose um, is to bring a delegation from the NACW and to bring the National Women's Party on board to help win her objectives. And while the words that were exchanged during that meeting in February um, haven't survived, um, we do know what Alice Paul did next. Um, she begins that winter to fold up the National Women's Party um, to conclude this chapter of its activism. And by 1923-24, Alice Paul will be at the uh, debut of a new campaign for yet another constitutional amendment, um, this time an equal rights amendment, um, parenthetically an amendment that is still awkwardly making its way to ratification even today. But the point from the perspective of Hallie Quinn Brown is indeed that black women are going to go it alone um, out of the uh, disappointments of the 19th amendment, out of the ashes of that troubled election season in 1920. Now African-American women um, will lead themselves um, clearly and directly um, on the road to winning voting rights. It is a long journey, um, some 45 years um, from the ratification of the 19th Amendment in 1920 to the passage in 1965 of the Voting Rights Act. That federal legislation that Hallie Quinn Brown had envisioned in 1920 um, takes 45 years to secure. How do black women do that? 
The first answer is that they continue the work that they have begun. Um, here, um, black women are going to invest heavily, concertedly, consistently in what we might call the ground game of American politics. What does that mean? When they can, they are going to continue to register to vote, yes. Uh, when they can, they are going to cast ballots, of course. They are going to become party activists and operatives, especially in what was then the Republican Party. Uh, black women are going to um, create their own national association within the Republican Party and are going to become part of the party machines that are operating at the state and local level in these years. And this organizing, um, this in the trenches work does indeed pay off in some jurisdictions where black women do have the ballot. Perhaps the best example comes from the city of Chicago um, where the great educator anti-lynching advocate and suffragist, Ida B. Wells um, has organized her Alpha Suffrage Club. There, the women of the Alpha Suffrage Club can indeed cast their ballots. They do so for Republican Party candidates, including African-American men candidates. And in 1928, we'll see uh, the fruits of their efforts in the election of Oscar de Priest to Congress out of Chicago, de Priest being the very first African-American man to be elected to Congress since 1901. So in the ground game, black women are indeed pushing the needle, fulfilling the promise of voting rights, insisting on the promise of voting rights when and where they can. Um, but for many women, the legal hurdles um, remain formidable. Um, Jim Crow laws remain uh, insurmountable barriers. And so this campaign also requires the work of a legal team, a legal team that is centered um, in the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Within the NAACP, um, best remembered perhaps for the campaign against segregated public education that culminates in Brown versus Board of Education in 1954, parallel to the campaign um, that culminates in Brown, the NAACP is also litigating voting rights for Black Americans, chipping away at that facet of the uh, edifice that was Jim Crow, successfully defeating poll taxes, successfully defeating the grandfather clause, successfully defeating whites only primaries. The litigation campaign is prying open the door to ballot access for black Americans, including black women, during these years, um, this is an essential facet of the campaign toward the uh, winning of the Voting Rights Act. Finally, of course, there is by the 1940s, the beginnings of the modern civil rights revolution. Here now, black women are leaders, they are organizers, they are architects, but importantly, of course, they are the foot soldiers, the fundraisers, they are the heart um, and they are the shock troops of the modern civil rights revolution. Um, they will be there in those extraordinary scenes in cities like Selma, Alabama, um, behind the scenes um, and in front of the cameras and more um, insisting on voting rights, holding the feet of the nation um, to um, the fire of black voting rights, holding the nation up to the scrutiny of the world, um, bringing the voting rights struggle into um, living rooms 
um, via television, um, African-American women um, are pressing on Congress, pressing on um, ultimately President Lyndon Johnson um, to commit to African-American voting rights through federal legislation. This is the campaign that will culminate in 1965 with the passage of the Voting Rights Act in that year. One of the questions that I'm often asked, has anything changed um, in a hundred years? Um, and I have to confess um, that having completed the 2020 election cycle that we all have been part of, been witness to, um, perhaps are still processing in our own ways. Um, the parallels, um, the, con uh, uh, the continuities between um, 1920 and 2020 um, are um, concerning, um, should give us pause, um, and are a measure of um, how um, little we have traveled in a hundred years. Um, voter suppression um, in 1920 was practiced in the name of maintaining the integrity um, of uh, elections in the United States. It was accomplished by legal subterfuge that was largely race neutral on its face, um, but was strategically crafted and implemented to keep black Americans vastly disproportionately from the polls. Um, today, in 19, uh, excuse me, in 2020, um, we saw precisely how voter suppression tactics, neutral on their face with respect to race, exacted a disproportionate cost from voters of color, from poor and working voters in a uh, hundred years later. Um, so there is an important way in this way in which this story, I think, and I hope is instructive to us as we puzzle over, grapple with, and engage in activism in our own time, as we wonder um, how it is that voter suppression could resurface, could reemerge, appears to be so deeply entrenched in our political culture. Part of the answer, I think, lies in this story I've shared with you today. And at the same time, I think it's fair to say um, that um, two things are true as we sit here in the winter of 2021. Um, and the second thing um, is that a great deal has changed for African-American women with respect to voting rights, with respect to their role in the body politic, with respect to their political leadership over the course of uh, 100 years. Um, a great deal has changed indeed. Um, and it is in no small part, of course, um, a credit to that movement that we briefly visited this evening that take us, takes us from 1920 to 1965. So what has changed? Um, well, we've witnessed it, haven't we, in these last months. Um, African-American women um, organizers um, who in the great tradition of those women in St. Louis, Missouri and Daytona, Florida, who deeply invested in the ground game in real time during every election cycle to get women registered, to get their ballots cast, to get their ballots counted. Um, that tradition we have seen continued in the work of extraordinary black women leaders, including 
uh, Latasha Brown, leader Stacey Abrams, and so many others in this country in 2020. Black women are still doing that work. What else has changed? Black women running for public office. In 2020, Black women shattered the record when it came to vying for seats in the US Congress. 130 Black women ran for Congress in this recent season. Another manifestation of how things have transformed since 1920. Um, black women vying for in unprecedented numbers and winning um, in impressive numbers as well, um, public office in the US Congress and of course at the state and national level as well. So here um, office holding is now a facet that I think very few Americans could have even imagined a um, hundred years ago. Finally, of course, there is the fact of black women at the polls. Um, and by every measure, um, we understand how consequential um, a turnout that can be. Um, it was true in 2017 um, when in Alabama, um, the Democrat Doug Jones um, vied for a US Senate seat um, in a special election. Um, Jones was put over the top by black women's votes um, and uh, helped, they helped ensure that that state's uh, Senate seat in that contest flipped from uh, red to blue. Um, more recently, whether it was in um, 2016, 2018, and certainly in 2020, um, 95 plus percent of black women um, voting um, the Democratic Party line, um, that margin um, that um, uh, ensured, um, helped to ensure um, just this past November, um, a victory for the Democratic candidates. Um, so black women turning out and using um, that important um, capacity at the polls um, to great effect um, as they had done back in 1928 when they helped to elect Oscar DePries to Congress. Um, there is of course, um, I think again, the nearly unthinkable in 1920 um, election of uh, Kamala Harris to the vice presidency. And when it comes to Senator Harris, now Vice President Harris, but then Senator Harris, who was nominated back in the summer of 2020, um, the first thing I wanna underscore is that she was in that season, not the only by any stretch, but one of six black women who um, names appeared on uh, Joe Biden's uh, short list as he vetted running mates. Um, that number, the six, is I think what really um, should uh, be the point of reflection for us um, because it evidences um, how many um, and how robust Black women are in American politics such that there were six Black women candidates uh, vying for that spot, um, formidable candidates vying for that spot, any of whom could have run alongside Joe Biden. It happened to be Kamala Harris. Um, but we understand how Black women have since 1965 prepared for and positioned themselves um, to hold even the highest often, uh, excuse me, the highest office in the land. Um, so this story in 2020, um, I think is one that persuades me um, that when we um, contrast 1920 to 2020, we can see how far black women have traveled have brought themselves in American politics. We can see 
um, that they have gone from being firsts, women who are breaking glass ceilings or breaking barriers, um, to a force in American politics. And the next chapter for us, um, the next fascinating chapter for us will be to um, watch some of us to even participate in um, what that force in American politics will rot, um, how it will not only lead us, but how it will change us as an electorate. Now, one of my favorite moments from the 2020 election season came pretty early on. Um, it was August. Joe Biden had selected Kamala Harris as his running mate. The Democrats held their national convention and um, Kamala Harris took the stage um, on national television. Most of us watched at home uh, in quarantine locked down, um, socially distanced, uh, but there she was to accept the nomination. It was a historic moment by all accounts and millions upon millions of Americans tuned in. And Senator Harris in her, then Senator Harris in her remarks, um, uh, took time to uh, pay a sort of tribute to the women, as she put it, the women on whose shoulders she stood that evening as she accepted the nomination. Um, the first woman, those of you who heard the speech might recall, the first woman she invoked was her own mother, um, an immigrant to the United States from India, um, a uh, cancer researcher um, who raised her daughters um, to know no limits when it came to their uh, professional aspirations. And Kamala Harris paid tribute uh, to her mother. Um, she then went on to, I'll put it this way, I think offer us a challenge, um, a sort of quiz about our knowledge of American political history um, as she invoked then six black American women from the annals of the vanguard, um, women whose public lives stretch back to the 19th century, the women on whose shoulders she stood. I will tell you who they were in a moment, but before I do, um, I wanna underscore that Senator Harris did not invoke Elizabeth Cady Stanton or Susan Anthony. She did not invoke Frederick Douglass nor Thomas Jefferson. She explained how she had arrived at this pinnacle position in American politics by way of women who had made a way for her, by way of a political philosophy, by way of a set of practices, by way of organizing, by way of movements um, that were led by African-American women. Um, and I do think for many Americans, it was a moment of befuddlement. It was a moment for curiosity. It was a moment, if you will, to do some homework um, because to understand, to be astute, to be fully a part of African-American women, of, Af of American politics in 2020 required a different sort of political education. So who did she invoke? Mary Church Terrell, Ida B. Wells, Mary McLeod Bethune, Diane Nash, Fannie Lou Hamer, Constance Baker Motley. These six women um, explain for Senator, now Vice President Harris, how she had come to that moment in August of 2020. It is an extraordinary pantheon. Um, and if you're someone like me, you're jumping out of your seat because you've just finished a book um, that looks to highlight these women. Um, so let me just um, briefly sketch um, who they are. Uh, Mary Church Terrell, um, an Oberlin College graduate and educator herself in Washington, DC, 
um, the very first president in 1896 of the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs. Terrell was herself a suffragist, a radical one, um, who always still insisted, even in light of the sort of racism that she was confronted by when she engaged in suffrage politics nationally, Terrell always insisted that African-American women should have a seat at that table, that African-American women should lead their own political futures um, as much as she was an ally to women like Carrie Chapman Catt and Susan B. Anthony, she was a critic um, who insisted that black women always spoke and represented themselves in that movement. Ida B. Wells, um, the suffrage organizer in Chicago that I've mentioned, a native of Mississippi um, who uh, began her professional life as an educator and then a journalist in Memphis, Tennessee, um, run out of that town as she emerges as one of the country's most sharp and effective critics of the scourge of lynching um, as it emerges in the 1890s. Um, Wells is someone who teaches us how black women always worked by way of two companion tracks, that they were both ardent advocates of their own political rights, including the right to vote, while they also were impassioned and effective advocates for uh, civil rights, um, including protection against lynching. Um, here, Wells helps us understand why black women do not join in important numbers, white led suffrage associations, and instead create organizations like the National Association of Colored Women. It is through that organization and others like it that women like Wells are able to practice, to organize, to promote their own vision um, of American politics. And it is, as we say in 21st century parlance, an intersectional one, one that simultaneously challenges racism and sexism. I've already introduced the third woman on Kamala Harris's list, Mary McLeod Bethune, and I've introduced her as an educator in Daytona, Florida, as a suffragist in that state. I also told you that Mrs. Bethune by 1922 has been violently um, discouraged from the arena of voting rights. She will head to Washington DC by the 1930s where she will found a new umbrella political organization that brings together black women from many sectors of um, social and political and cultural life, the National Council of Negro Women. And through that work, she will win the attention and the allyship of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. And Franklin Roosevelt, while in the White House, will bring Mrs. Bethune in to help him organize what is colloquially remembered as Franklin Roosevelt's Black Cabinet. What is Mrs. Bethune's agenda? Mrs. Bethune is especially concerned about helping lift Black Americans out of the um, trenches of the Depression. And she comes to Washington, not only to win Roosevelt's alliance, not only to um, help create his Black cabinet, this national phalanx of Black leaders who will help to uh, develop the president's programs, she is going to use not the vote, which she still hasn't secured in the state of Florida, not the vote, um, but patronage to bring Black American leaders and operatives into the federal New Deal agencies that are being created out of the depression so that these folks can now steer resources to Black Americans. It's an end run around disenfranchisement. Mrs. Bethune, Mrs. Bethune knows how to use um, the power, the president's power, 
of appointment to federal agencies to bring Black Americans into the political ranks in Washington, even when they cannot cast ballots in their home states. She is a tireless politician over many years. Um, and by 1945, we find Mrs. Bethune yet again remaking her vision um, into an internationalist one. She will be there in 1945 in San Francisco for the founding of the United Nations um, and will strike up an alliance with women of color from across the globe who see in her struggles against American apartheid, against Jim Crow, echoes of their own struggles against apartheid in South Africa, against colonialism in India and more. Uh, Mrs. Bethune um, continues to invent and reinvent herself um, across the 20th century. Diane Nash and Fannie Lou Hamer Figures from the modern civil rights revolution were also on Kamala Harris's list. They are two sides, I think, of the same coin. Diane Nash, the strategist, the architect, who works behind the scenes in the civil rights years in some of its most critical moments. In Nashville, Tennessee, during the student sit-ins that challenge segregation in public accommodations there. During the Freedom Rides, when uh, Diane Nash will be responsible for sending new um, refreshed troops um, onto those buses as they make their way treacherously, treacherously through the American South. Um, Diane Nash will ensure um, that those buses and those waiting rooms are not abandoned during the freedom rides um, by sending courageous young people from Tennessee further south to fill those seats. And by 1963 and 64, Nash is fully immersed in the struggle for voting rights, sets her sights on what we come to remember as the Selma campaign, those fateful marches across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Alabama, it is Diane Nash who is behind the scenes, not in front of the cameras crossing that bridge, but behind the scenes, getting those marchers um, organized in Selma, and then organizing the paramedics who will tend to them when they are attacked um, by state and local police in their attempt to march to the state capitol to insist on voting rights in the state of Alabama. Contrast Diane Nash to Fannie Lou Hamer, the one-time sharecropper turned student nonviolent coordinating committee organizer um, who in the state of Mississippi pays with her life pays with her life, nearly pays with her life, and certainly pays with her livelihood for her voting rights work. By 1964, Mrs. Hamer will lead the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party to the Democratic National Convention. Why? The state of Mississippi um, has offered and seated an all white delegation one that was selected without the input, without the consideration, without the votes of Black Mississippians. Mrs. Hamer shows up with her own delegation, insists on being seated, and in this holds the feet of the Democratic Party and of its nominee, Lyndon Johnson, to the feet of the fire of voting rights. Mrs. Hamer understands the camera, particularly the moving camera, the television camera, and uses it to historic effect in 1964 at the Democratic National Convention. She will testify with the cameras rolling before the credentials committee there, and she will bring the African-American struggle for voting rights into the limbering rooms of Americans, most of them far, far away, 
from Mississippi and the American South where she is doing her work day in and day out. Her remarks are anticipated to be such a upset to the scheme and the organization of the Democratic Party that Lyndon Johnson back in Washington will hold an impromptu press conference in an effort to draw the cameras away from Mrs. Hamer's remarks. And he succeeds, at least for the moment. But that evening they will be rebroadcast and I recommend them to you. You can watch them yourselves on YouTube and appreciate that Fannie Lou Hamer was a most artful, artful um, user um, of the uh, power of television in the modern civil rights era. Finally, last but not least, on Kamala Harris's list was Constance Baker Motley. And Mrs. Motley was the woman member of that NAACP litigation team that was litigating voting rights along with the desegregation of public education um, in the years between 1920 and 1945. Constance Baker Motley will go on to hold public office um, first in New York City and then in the New York State Legislature. And after 1965, it will be Lyndon Johnson who will appoint Constance Baker Motley to the federal bench where she will sit for the remainder of her career now an enforcer of civil rights, an enforcer of voting rights, an enforcer of the vision that figures like Mary Church Terrell, Ida B. Wells, Mary McLeod Bethune, Diane Nash, and Fannie Lou Hamer had championed. So when Kamala Harris um, tells her story, she offers us an opportunity to learn a new chapter, a new facet, a new thread in the story of American politics. It is a story told through the courage, through the sacrifice, through the genius and more of African-American women. Um, and we here in the 21st century will witness um, in our own time how Senator Harris along now, Vice President Harris, I'm still getting used to that, Vice President Harris um, and the force of African-American women more broadly, how indeed um, that will be unleashed to reshape um, our politics in our own time. I'll end with a sort of question. Um, uh, a question that I've been asked um, many, many times in this work um, that goes something like, um, why didn't I learn this in school? Um, when it comes from a young person, oftentimes it's a little more pointed. Why has this history been kept from us? Um, and for a long time, I thought the answer lay, and it does to some degree, right, in, um, you know, the complicated relationship between um, academic historians and the work we produce, how that makes its way into classrooms, onto standardized tests, into curricula, to textbooks and more. Um, that is part of the story. And it has been a real honor in talking about this book to um, speak many, many times with K through 12 educators about how to take this history, which is new to many of them, as well, how to take this history and how to bring it um, into their classrooms. But then a few weeks ago, I had an experience that I, 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 I never uh, might have anticipated. Um, and it was um, a moment in which a, a public library in Lafayette, Louisiana, um, in essence, suppressed Vanguard and the stories of the women uh, uh, whose uh, political lives I've shared with you tonight. Um, Vanguard was slated to be one of two books on the history of voting rights and voter suppression that would be, was to be part of a public program in Lafayette, sponsored by the public library. Um, but when the library scrutinized the program, um, it determined that um, 
it wasn't neutral enough. It wasn't too decided enough. And um, they declined the grant, um, declined the speakers, declined the books. Um, and it was my very first experience with having my work um, suppressed in that way. And it is a reminder, I think, that here in the 21st century, um, in some corners, um, merely to speak of voting rights, merely to recount the history of voting rights struggles, um, merely to foreground the role that Black American women have and continue to play in our democracy is, is by some deemed um, out of bounds um, and um, not acceptable content. Um, and uh, I won't put myself in the minds of the library board members who um, declined that program and declined the opportunity for a public shared discussion of Vanguard there in Lafayette. Um, but I will say, um, for me, it is a new answer to that question. Um, why haven't we learned this history? Um, it is in part because there are people um, for whom this history is still too incendiary um, to, be, uh, to be told, to be taught. Um, so I think with that, um, I'll end, I'll, I, but I will say that um, thank you to the University of Louisiana at Lafayette for, and the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities for staying with the program um, that was uh, declined by the library board. Um, and as I understand it, the program will indeed find a home um, and find an audience there in Lafayette. And um, for that, I'm very grateful. Um, so I'm also grateful to you um, and to everyone there in Minneapolis and St. Paul for having me um, as part of your program this evening. And I believe that Danielle Dart will uh, rejoin me. Is that right, Danielle? And, uh, and, um, uh, and we'll have a little conversation um, and some discussion. And thank you again so much, uh, Danielle, for um, having me with you tonight. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jones. It's been wonderful um, having you back with us. And uh, we do have some questions to start us out. The first one is from Mary, and she has a question about Black women's activism and um, churches. And yes. so um, can you talk more about that particular history? Yes, thank you very much um, for that question, Mary. Um, and. Um, for those who haven't had a chance to peek at Vanguard, um, uh, what Mary is, I think, alluding to is that this is a book that begins, um, interestingly, perhaps, and maybe unexpectedly, um, with a figure um, from early America, a Black woman preacher named Jarena Lee, um, who in the early decades of the 19th century is involved in a long struggle um, within her African Methodist Episcopal Church denomination, a long struggle um, over her um, right to preach. Um, Jarena Lee wants a preaching license. She's a great preacher by all accounts. But as you might imagine, she encounters a great deal of resistance um, in, um, her, uh, in her quest. Why do I start there? Um, in part because I was looking for the roots, um, yes, of the activism, but as importantly, the ideas that animate African-American women's politics over the long history of this country. In particular, just looking for the roots of that critique that today we, some of us refer to as intersectionality, um, but is that a critique, right? That decries the way in which racism and sexism come together um, with a particularity um, that not only discriminates against, but suppresses black women's public and political power. Um, and, in doing that, I keep pulling a thread, and before I know it, there I am in the 1820s with Jarena Lee, who um, fortunately for us, leaves a memoir in which she not only recounts her experiences, but she puts on paper her thinking about the dilemma that she faces in her church. And she is at work on that political theory um, that she and other Black women in the early decades of the 19th century will pioneer, 
um, that will be fully crystallized by the middle of the 19th century and really will become the guiding principle for Black women's politics, we might say, until today. Um, so Jarena Lee is essential. And in this book, um, from Lee's individual and um, truly remarkable um, life, uh, we are introduced to the ways in which Black women in church communities are waging their own struggles for political power, the right to hold office, the right to preach, um, the right to uh, run conferences, the right to control uh, monies. And this is a crucible out of which Black women come to the secular political sphere um, by the end of the 19th century and found organizations like the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs. Um, among those leaders are church women who had learned politics first in church. So for the women in my story, um, you can't understand them if you don't understand the, um, the force and the uh, possibilities that are forged in church um, and how they are then made manifest in the secular realm. Thank you. Uh, Claire has a question about the women that uh, Vice President Harris cited. They were well-educated middle-class women were there working class women who participated in the struggle for voting rights? Uh, obviously, Fannie Lou Hamer is one of them, but who else? Well, that is a, a formidable question. Um, on the one hand, we can remember um, that, um, you know, uh, someone like Mary McLeod Bethune, who's born in 1875, is um, the last of 12 children um, of poor farmers. Um, the only child in her family to be educated, um, which she is modestly, but importantly. Um, Mrs. Bethune understands the politics of respectability. Mrs. Bethune understands um, uh, the um, class and color politics um, of um, her time. Um, and yet I think it's difficult to brand uh, it, because there's a, a hint, I think, in the question of a kind of pejorative um, that Mrs. Bethune, I think, remains rooted in a community of women who are tens and hundreds of thousands strong, um, many, many of them working women, even as she herself emerges as a leader leads an institution that is committed to the education of African-American girls in the state of Florida, most of them um, by and large um, poor and working class African-American girls. Um, and so um, how to speak about somebody like Mary McLeod Bethune, who at the same time, right, is a uh, compatriot of American presidents. I think it's a challenge for us. And I don't mm. think um, uh, class dichotomies quite capture that. How do we think about an Ida Wells um, mm. uh, or a Mary Church Terrell um, born before slavery is abolished um, and um, yet come to live lives that are um, very different from those of the generation of their parents. Um, that um, part of what we're seeing um, are indeed women for whom um, ed, uh, they are the first generation um, to have the opportunity for education, certainly higher education. Um, and we might appreciate, for example, how Mary Church Terrell is a teacher in Washington at the M Street Schools. Um, among her students is Nanny Helen Burroughs, who's going to lead um, 3 million Black Baptist women um, across the United States. And, and um, Burroughs is going to remain resolutely committed to working women um, to working poor Black women across the nation, organized under the auspices of the um, Black Baptist Church 
even as she is also a suffragist. Um, so I guess one way to answer your question is to say to me that the dichotomies don't hold very well. I think when we probe the lives and the biographies of many of these women, I'd say Mary Church Terrell is very much an exception to that um, with a very elite origins. Um, uh, but I do think that um, they're more complex than that. And even the um, National Association of Colored Women with 300,000 members um, is a far more diverse organization than I think we've appreciated. And I, and I think we haven't written those histories um, well enough yet. And uh, I look forward, for example, to the work coming out from uh, Brianna Royster, um, who's a, a PhD candidate at NYU, who is working on uh, black women suffragists in the state of Mississippi in the early 20th century. And I can assure you, it is not a story um, that easily um, uh, comports to lines of, uh, of class. And so uh, we have a lot to look forward to and more to learn about that. Thank you. We have more uh, really good questions. Um, Mike wants to know, uh, how did black women talk with black men about gender inequality and racial inequality. So that intersectional experience and did black men see these as equal injustices? Well, I'm gonna give you the good historian's answer, Mike. It depends, <laughs> it really <laughs> depends. Um, you know, uh, um, which is to, but, but importantly, what I can say with a broad stroke is um, what characterizes black women's politics they're organizing and more is that they never abandon the institutions they share with African-American men, whether it's anti-slavery societies or colored conventions in the early period, whether it's civil rights organizations or churches, um, black women never abandon that struggle um, with their male counterparts um, for how those shared institutions are going to be organized um, along lines of gender. Um, and so that is why churches figure so importantly in this book, why we spend time in the pre-Civil War colored conventions um, and more um, because black women are not working through um, solely through women's organizations at any point in this story. Um, they have some interesting successes, including in churches where at the um, end of the 19th century in a church like the AME Zion Church, women will be pressing for more and more power and authority. They will want to be ordained as ministers. They succeed um, and they win that right um, because they have powerful male allies. Um, but if we pushed back to the years before the Civil War and we looked at the, the vibrant and robust colored convention movement, um, women never really break through in that movement. They, um, they shatter the ceiling, I guess, the glass ceiling, but they never sit comfortably or are well situated in that political culture. Um, uh, even as they have some male allies, men like Frederick Douglass. Um, so it's an uneven story for sure. And among the questions that Black Americans are asking about their own institutions, like the NAACP and the AME churches, um, what's the true Black institution? Is it the one that takes the progressive and unorthodox and unexpected view about women and makes them leaders? Or is it the one that affirms and uh, entrenches patriarchy. Um, that is a debate in the 19th century, in the 20th century, and I'm sure there are folks on our call who could testify it's a debate in the 21st century still. Missy wants to know about, wants you to, would like you to talk about the role of HBCUs in Black women's suffrage. So for everybody who doesn't know the, what HBCU stands for, that's historically Black colleges and universities. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, it's so important and such a foundational 
place for uh, many of the women who I've invoked tonight. I'll go back to Hallie Quinn Brown, who I mentioned had been president of the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs in 1920. Um, Brown had been educated and then became a faculty member at Wilberforce College in Ohio, um, where there is a fascinating cadre of black women suffragists. Um, they are club women, they are educated and now educators, um, they are deans of women, they are faculty members. Um, and for them, Wilberforce is, um, is the hub um, for their work. Um, I worked on this a bit with some of my students and I said to them, you know, we just want to imagine what, you know, the dining hall conversation was when you had, you know, a half dozen of these black women suffragists who were spending part of their time traveling and organizing um, across the state and across the country and the other half of their time as educators um, and administrators at a place like Wilberforce, um, I'd love to be right um, a fly on the wall during those dinner conversations because um, Wilberforce is clearly um, the center and the hub and the 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 crucible for um, their relationships and for their um, ideas. You know, it will be young women from Howard University who will be um, some of the most um, visible black suffragists in a city like Washington, D.C. in the years leading up to ratification of the 19th Amendment. Um, young students from Howard and some of their faculty who will turn out, for example, during Alice Paul's 1913 um, Women's Parade. Um, uh, the young, these are young women um, who are um, the members of the Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Um, so HBCUs are critical years if we come all the way forward to Diane Nash at Fisk, um, for example, who is organizing um, young black people um, for what will evolve into the campaign for voting rights. Um, I think you can't tell this story without um, uh, considering HBCUs. Thank you. MJ has a question about um, that I think speaks to the many of the misconceptions about and the fragility of voting rights um, in the United States. That is, she they ask, is voting a constitutional right or a federal law? Um, neither. Um, there is no right to vote in the United States by way of the US Constitution. Um, the US Constitution by the 15th Amendment um, will prohibit the states from using race as a criteria when it comes to voting rights. A 19th Amendment that will prohibit the states from using sex as a criteria when it comes to voting rights. Um, much later on in the Vietnam era, yet another amendment that prohibits the states from using age, um, at least after the age of 18, as a criteria for voting rights. But these are prohibitions on the states. They're not guarantees of the right to vote. And this is why voter suppression can flourish, especially um, after when it, after 2013, when in the case of Shelby County versus Holder, the US Supreme Court guts the most uh, forceful provisions of the Voting Rights Act. Um, so um, take a look at your own state constitution. I'm gonna venture an educated guess and say, while there are lots of prescriptions about voting, um, no one is guaranteed the right to vote. My home state of Maryland, which prides itself on not having indulged in any sort of, you know, significant voter suppression schemes, doesn't guarantee anyone the right to vote. Um, and we experienced that, didn't we? In the midst of a pandemic, in an election day held during the pandemic, where, what? Some of us got to vote and others of us didn't. Some of us were required to risk our health and our well-being in order 
to do so because we weren't guaranteed the right to vote. The burden remains on us as citizens, right, to navigate that world. Um, and if we compared votes, I bet we'd discover that the way we vote in Maryland is not the way you vote in Minnesota um, because um, you only have to look across to your neighbor um, to the west or the east or the south or the north um, in the neighboring states to appreciate um, that there is no federal guarantee of a right to vote in the United States. Um, there are limits on what the states can do, um, but states do a great deal to keep us um, from the polls even today. Thank you. I, I think that's all. I always want to take the opportunities to um, have that reiterated. Final question. Um, I'm going to sort of merge two questions. Anonymous and Jacob are both uh, asking questions basically about how you counter arguments that people make, whether it's a colleague or, you know, our curriculum, our social studies curriculum is being written, rewritten right now in Minnesota, who challenged the inclusion of histories like the one you have explored in Vanguard um, as not real history, as revisionist, you know, mm -hmm. the um, traditional as a sort of contradictory traditional values, what arguments um, should, do you think people could use? Mm -hmm. I was gonna say, um, I should probably count myself fortunate that I am not on the front lines of those negotiations, but I'm deeply grateful and appreciative of those of you who are. Um, and these days, my best argument is the one that I think is sort of run through this talk. And certainly, uh, I tried to underscore at the end, which is how on earth uh, do we expect young people um, to arrive at a state house um, or in Congress or in a city hall where black women are among the leaders? Um, how do we expect them to arrive there and? be effective if they don't understand the political history, the political tradition, um, the orientation that those women leaders bring um, to the political sphere. You would feel um, deficient if your students didn't come away with some sense about uh, Jefferson, for example, right? you'd, you'd, you'd feel yourself, you hadn't done justice because Jefferson is a shared text, right? Troubled as he might be, he's a shared text. He's the touchstone in American political history. Um, Lincoln, right? you gotta know Lincoln, right? To be conversant, right? In, in the realm of, you got, for goodness sakes, you at least gotta know who those busts are, right? And, and why it is that they decorate the state house, for example. Um, and for me, the advent of Vice President Harris um, in Washington um, reset the equation now. And I don't think you can expect to be um, effective, insightful, intelligent, um, savvy, uh, or anything, right? If you don't understand this political history, this is political history, it's American political history. Um, here's the way I, I've been thinking about it. Um, I have no experience in the diplomatic corps, so forgive me those of you who do. But imagine now you are the delegation from Japan um, planning for a state visit in Washington and you brief your diplomats um, on the major figures, the president, the vice president. Um, you brief them on um, political history. I've done some of that work. You know, you, you do these, you know, kind of, you do these briefings where you teach, you know, US history in a nutshell, right? To folks who are coming here, you know, for corporate work, for diplomatic missions and more. Um, well, what do you need to teach in order for folks to understand who the heck Kamala Harris is talking about when she invokes a Mary McLeod Bethune or a, a Mary Church Terrell? Um, you do not want your uh, representatives to be uh, caught out or flat-footed 
or not in the know. And so I think that um, as Black women become leaders, um, how on earth do we um, do business with our political leaders in part by in, in part understanding them, you know, and understanding the histories out of which they have emerged and um, creating that common ground with them as we engage in those negotiations. So I think, yes, it's civics, but it's more about how to be effective and um, whether those black women are in your city hall or your mayor's office or they are um, in your state legislature or in Congress or in the White House. Um, I think it's time that we know uh, more about them so we can be better um, at working with them, um, much in the way we would for any other political leader. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that. I love that answer. <laughs> so, um... I just wanna say thank you to Professor Jones. Thank you to all of you for coming tonight and uh, join us again next month for uh, the third history forum with Bruce Duthu, who is professor of history at Dartmouth College. And he will be talking about the history of Native American sovereignty and the tensions between sovereign native nations and the United States. So come back and join us for that conversation next month. We'll see you then.